Welcome everyone to this webinar um, on based on the CEA census and looking at some of the sustainability metrics that came from it. I am your co-host today, Kylie Horomia from Way Beyond. I'm the head of industry transformation. Um, those of you unfamiliar with Way Beyond, we support commercial growers who want to improve their farm management through AI and data solutions. So that includes things like uh, yield prediction, sensor technology, um, crop management, things like that. So I am joined by uh, my co-host and co-editor of the report, Ricky Stevens. Ricky. Thanks, Kylie. Hi, everyone. I'm Ricky Stevens. I'm the director of digital strategy at Agritecture. We are a global urban and controlled environment agriculture advisory and data services firm. Um, we work globally and we have folks around the world, North America, Europe, um, GCC. And i um, really excited to be here with you. We have got an awesome panel of experts for you, uh, which we will get to momentarily. But really quickly, you know, Kylie brought up the CEA census report. That's really the reason that we're here is um, uncovering some of the interesting insights uh, and conclusions that came from that. Hopefully everybody has on this um, webinar has at least seen that. Maybe many of you have read it. Um, otherwise, uh, if one of my colleagues can just drop the link in the chat to where you can download your report for free, we'll of course be sending that out um, after the webinar as well. Um, but I'm going to give you just a quick two minute primer on what the census is. We'll certainly be talking about some of the data from it. So I want to make sure that everybody understands two things. One is why we do it, why Agritecture and Way Beyond have been doing the census for the last three years. And the second is a little bit of background and methodology on where the data comes from. I think that's really important to have that context to understand. So first and foremost, I would say the census is about transparency. Uh, both of our firms believe in the transformative power of controlled environment agriculture, but we also recognize that this is still a new industry and we acknowledge that there is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, and you can't manage or improve what you don't measure. So the census has become our way of answering some of our own questions about the industry and then publishing that data every year um, in these free reports for everybody to read to try to move the industry forward. Yeah. Um, and then for those you know, less familiar with the census um, and, and you know, the background, the context on it and the methodology, all of our data and insights in the report come from a lengthy survey of CEA operators that we send out um, over the course of usually two months uh, in the summer. Um, over the years, I think we've gotten more intelligent, Kylie, about our methodology for filtering out non-commercial operators from the data, removing outliers from the data set. So I think each year, the strength of the data and the reporting has improved a bit. And we're really satisfied to have had over 300 operators participate from more than 50 countries each year, making this the largest continuous global survey of CEA operations. Um, we do recognize, though, that there's potential for response bias. We are, of course, unable to validate all of the answers and numbers submitted from so many operations spread across the globe for free. <laughs> so our report is meant to contribute to the openness of aggregated industry numbers, more so than it's meant to be taken as exact baselines for the entire industry. Um, there's also always more questions we want to ask than what's feasible to expect of operators to answer. So even with all of our data, we're often still left with just as many questions as answers. Uh, but that's what makes these conversations even more important. So well, with that, um, unless you have anything to add, Kylie, I would love to meet some of our wonderful panelists and get into the conversation. Absolutely. Um, oh, and actually, just, just on that, though, I mean, the, the the latest report, 60% of those respondents were CEOs and founders. So um, I'm, I'm excited about that because it, it actually lends itself to the validity of, of the responses we got. So, um, you know, all these numbers, all the things we do, it's a crazy journey that, you know, Ricky and I go on every year. It's uh, months of work, I must say. Um, but again, it, it just stemmed from us wanting to know what is happening in our own industry and how then how we can share that information for free for everyone else. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So let, let us meet uh, these expert panelists that we have here today. Um, Who do you want to start with, Ricky? Uh, let's start with Gretchen. Yeah. Hi, 
I'm Gretchen Schimmelfennig. I'm Technical and Operations Director of Resource Innovation Institute. We're a data-driven nonprofit organization founded in 2016 in Portland, Oregon to accelerate resource efficiency, initially just in the cannabis cultivation space, but recently have been funded by a USDA NRCS grant to expand our work to the entire CEA space. So as Technical and Operations Director, I manage the PowerScore resource benchmarking platform facilitate our technical advisory council working groups and create curriculum and training to educate producers, efficiency programs and design and construction communities. So um, you might see me writing in greenhouse grower, greenhouse management, cannabis business times and the cultivation classroom column of cannabis science and tech. Thanks very much Agritecture for inviting me to be here. Thanks Gretchen, really thrilled to have you. Um, let's continue on in alphabetical order. And so Tracy by a hair, um, you can go next. Super. Thank you very much for um, thank you very much for the invitation today. Um, I'm Tracy Nazaro, I'm president and founder of Traders Hill Farm. Um, Traders Hill Farm is a commercial aquaponic greenhouse operation located in Northeast Florida. We're a year-round grower of leafy greens, primarily romaine um, head lettuce for the food service market. We were founded in 2015 with the mission to become a standard bearer for cleaner, safer specialty produce and sustainably farmed fish. Um, sustainability is one of our, our core values um, committed to sustainability. And we define at Trader Soul Farm um, sustainability as that we continually strive to do more with less. And it is our responsibility to create a fiscally stable and environmentally sustainable agribusiness. And in conjunction with managing risk, we endeavor to reduce our company's footprint and serve as better stewards for the environment, which, which all is, um, it's a, it, it really for us is a journey as much as it is a destination. Great, thank you, Tracy. Uh, and let's move on to our last panelist, Travis. Hello everybody, Travis Graham, I'm with uh, Schneider Electric. I am the uh, the global segment lead for horticulture within Schneider Electric. Um, Schneider has been around for a while. They are a large global industrial automation company focused on innovation and energy and sustainability. Um, we recognize that this industry is a, is a, our segment is a massive impact on sustainability. Um, and we want to bring our expertise. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of is Schneider was ranked as the most sustainable company in the world out of 8,000 top companies last year. So we're bringing that, that knowledge and, and idea into the horticulture and indoor growing segment. Amazing. Um, just one quick note before we get into questions here for our panelists, a reminder to use the Q&A to ask our speakers any questions at any point in time. Um, we'll probably get to most of those after we get through our round of questions. And you can also ask questions to Kylie and me about the census report as well. Mm -hmm. um, and any questions we can't get to, we will follow up uh, after the webinar and get back in touch with you directly. So thank you for that. Um, all right, so let's actually dive into probably what is one of the most contentious metrics in the report. And this is a question for all panelists. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Tracy. Uh, as a grower, why do you think 70% uh, of CEA operators feel that the industry is uh, susceptible to excessive greenwashing? Well, I think that the, the, the challenge is, you know, as an industry, um, the way that we grow, it is very, it should be very sustainable, right? I mean, it should, because of we have recirculating water, we have water reuse, we produce more pounds per square foot, most of our food travels less food miles, minimal pesticide use. So those, um, that's as, as an industry, that's what our, our customers are looking for. But what we really haven't done as an industry is set those benchmarks to, to to really quantify how we as an industry are, are being more sustainable. And to do that, it's, it's imparting that to our customers, you know, really how much water does our facility use to grow? Um, how much does a facility consume in fossil fuels on an, on an annual basis? And, and, and how, are those, um, how are those benchmarks set? 
um, and how do and how do we measure them? Because I think that that's what's really going to um, take greenwashing out of the spotlight when there's the when there's more actual data. Um, interestingly, um, Trader Soul is participating in a pilot study with a Florida nonprofit that is working to create a sustainability certification for greenhouse growers, similar to the LEED certification for manufacturing. So what they're doing is they're looking at 150 data points that will provide a baseline so that you'll get a sustainability score. And then of course, once you have a baseline, then you can take that baseline and, and look for areas of improvement. So this is a pilot program for them. Um, they haven't, we're, we're one of the first greenhouses that is, um, that's participating in this study. So we're really um, excited to participate and see what our score is. And yet it's a little, um, a little nervous because um, you know, we, we want to be very sustainable and, um, and quantifying it will tell us how sustainable we really are. So were you surprised at that 70% number or was it something that you, you felt was, was realistic? Um, I, I was a little surprised at that, at that number. Um, and, it, and I think that because many of your respondents were CEOs and founders, it weighs on us heavily that, um, that, that, that this is what's expected of us. Mm -hmm. And we have to be sure that we're, that we're living up to that. Um, so, so Gretchen, same question for you. Um, greenwashing, what is going on and why? <clears throat> well, I think I, I would agree with Tracy that, you know, people need to step on the scale first. So what is green? How green is it? How green is it to a greenhouse? Like the pilot program she mentioned. Also though, we need to know how green is it for a vertical farm? They want to compare against each other. They want to compare against field farming too. So the lack of transparency and standards mean that CEA products can claim to be sustainable without having to prove how. So we do, even if they're doing great measures, they're not quantifying it for consumers. So companies do not measure sustainability in the same ways. Consumers can't distinguish between products that tout green approaches. So I'm glad that Tracy mentioned that initiative. Um, RII was funded by the USDA for our NRCS grant to also develop a certification program for CEA that's encompassing of greenhouses and indoor farms. Um, PowerScore, which I'll mention later in the workshop, has a database of um, many cannabis facilities and we're working with the USDA and our grower members and non-members to benchmark with us and do similar to what Tracy was talking about of creating baselines for the market first benchmarking, getting enough data, and then creating baselines. So until we can actually say what is green, everything is greenwashing if they make a claim without saying how. Mm, provocative. I like that. Um, let's kick it over to Travis to get his take uh, on this number and what we can do about it. And then we'll, we'll move on to some more specific questions for each of our panelists. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, and greenwashing is not just in the CEA, it's in it's in all industries right now, right? So this this term that's going around, um, and it's so for Schneider to get that ranking, that number one ranking, it took us fifteen years to get there. Um, this is not an overnight program, and what we see a lot, especially with that term greenwashing, is a singular focus on what that sustainability is. So when we look at sustainability, we look at it holistically. It isn't just energy use or water, but it's every aspect on what does sustainability mean? Is it a business that's sustainable? Is your workforce sustainable? Is, are you doing a, you know, an actual um, internal idea that everybody believes in that same idea of culture going forward? So um, I think because it is such a new industry, it's easy to say that it's a sustainable industry and everybody jumps on board. And I think that's the reason why they're saying, yeah, it's greenwashing because to the points that was already been, if we don't have a baseline and we're only maybe singular focused on certain aspects of it, then what does it actually mean in the end? So it sounds like we're all hearing similar things of, you know, the establishment of baselines is really important, right? Because anyone can make claims today um, without showing data or without comparing to a, um, a kind of baseline that we've all agreed to. Um, and then you know, nobody can be really sure how legitimate that claim is, right? So I want to kick it back to you, Gretchen, um, because of RII's work, um, all the, the kind of benchmarking that you guys are doing, 
tell us a little bit about what the metrics are that growers should be tracking. And if they're not currently tracking anything, where is it most sensible for them to start? Great. So like I mentioned about stepping on the scale, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So efficiency and productivity of resources and crop canopy, which affect operational expenses and profitability are where I would start. So resource efficiency measures the consumption of energy or water per unit of canopy area. Resource efficiency can also measure the production of emissions like solid waste, wastewater, and greenhouse gas emissions per unit of canopy area. And those can be ways that people measure how sustainable they're being with their use of resources in their canopy. Resource productivity, which is a metric that was in the CEA census, measures consumption of energy or water per unit of biomass production. So canopy productivity couples those together and measures production of biomass per unit of canopy area. So it takes the resources out of the equation, but brings in the revenue, right? So how much am I really utilizing the space and how much am I going to get out of that canopy? So the recipe for CEA success is getting yields and quality right at the optimal cost and resource impact. So more, more focus is really needed on measuring operational efficiency and productivity and incorporating those key performance indicators and comparing them to your key performance targets into the dashboards of what it means to succeed in CEA. So benchmarking is a low cost strategy that I would recommend to improve those KPIs I was mentioning like resource efficiency and productivity. Start with your pain points. Are your yields not consistent? Are utility bills increasing year over year? Calculate metrics with the data you have. RII's CEA benchmarking platform called PowerScore generates up to 15 key performance indicators for energy, water, and emissions efficiency and productivity. It's a free tool managed by a nonprofit and supported by the US Department of Agriculture. So if you're a CEA producer and wanna start tracking facility performance, visit our website at resourceinnovation.org slash PowerScore to check out the online survey and email me at Gretchen at resourceinnovation.org if you wanna become a CEA partner and access free services. So um, that's my answer is start with your pain points and use the data you have and then start to measure against the, the industry benchmarks that emerge. Can I ask a quick follow up on that really quick, Gretchen, um, which is, you know, obviously with benchmarking and, and we face this with the census is you have self-reported data. Um, how, how can we get to uh, maybe baselines that we have a little bit more faith in through validation? What are you guys doing on to, to validate some of these numbers? Great. So self-reported data is, is good, but it's not the best. And so system reported data and third party reported data, like, you know, utility bills or other sorts of inputs that growers get are other ways for us to get more baselines that we can trust on that are complementary of self-reported data. So data integration with benchmarking platforms like PowerScore. So we have an AI bill reader that takes in utility bills. <clears throat> and that means that a grower is not hand entering how much energy was used. We can trust that. We verify it with our eyes as well. And then we mark that KPI as verified if the grower chooses to get that KPI verified. So that's a way for things like ESG reporting or things like compliance for codes for certain types of cultivars. Um, we support cannabis in Massachusetts, for example. So as benchmarking is either voluntary or mandatory, um, that is something to consider. So, so Gretchen, you, you mentioned before it was a, a free tool, is that correct? Yep, PowerScore is free. Um, yeah. We need to have data and we need to gain trust in the market. So it's a yeah. mutual benefit for growers to, to gain competitive insights while they also help the, the market become more transparent. And, and look, that's, that's a really great thing to emphasize for any producer out there who feels that first step is an expensive one. And, and, you know, and often that can be, oh, for me to become sustainable, for my business to be sustainable, it's going to cost me a lot of money to get started. Well, I think Gretchen's just sort of proven there that, you know, that first step can also be free and, and just doing some of those measurements and, and looking around and using some of those tools will certainly be a great place to start if you haven't already. So thank you for that, Gretchen. Yeah, I'll add the only thing it can cost is time. So yeah. gathering data can be the, the hump that growers have to get over. And, um, and then uh, I'll mention that stepping on the scale itself can save you energy. Just by monitoring things, you can actually become more cognizant of how much you use and therefore become more efficient. So you might not even have to expend any capital. 
All right, thank you, Gretchen. Um, Travis, I wanna move on to you because one of the other, I think, um, it, interesting uh, tidbits of data that we got from the census was that it revealed that vertical farms on average are consuming seven times as much energy as greenhouses per kilogram of product. Um, so what specifically should vertical farms be doing differently when it comes to energy planning and management to reduce this carbon footprint? And really, it's it, it's not just the vertical farms, <clears throat> but it's this, this we have this discussion all the time with every industry, every customer. We had it internally ourselves starting many, many years ago. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a process, it's a roadmap. And we call it active energy management, right? So if we're just gonna focus on energy and power, we wanna create a, a roadmap from where you are today to where you wanna get. So our 15 year journey to get to 2020 was to be carbon neutral for scope one and scope two emissions, meaning you know, your direct lighting and, and the, the power systems. So now Schneider has a 2030, 2040 goal for scope three emissions, meaning all our suppliers are also gonna be carbon neutral when we get there. Massive undertaking, massive undertaking. So how do you do that? And not everybody wants to take on that big of a challenge. So we wanna start with at the very, very beginning. Obviously, you know, before the facility or anything goes on, especially if energy is a big part of your operational cost, you want to execute and design it from an energy viewpoint. Um, we see it all the time that a facility goes up and then they come back and say, wow, we didn't know the energy was going to be this much and we're in trouble now. The end result is that cost triple what it does at the very beginning. So if, if we, if you know it's going to be a challenge, you need to bring partners in. And so the way Schneider does is we, we break it down into parts. Like I said, it's a roadmap. And it's we start at the very beginning. How do you procure your energy, right? Are you doing it the most effective way, the least amount of way? What are the best resources? We have to look at all the, the areas. And every, not every state, but just about every state is different. And then there's counties that are different, deregulated. So you got to look at that. Then you jump into your, oh, go ahead, Ricky. Keep going. I'll, I'll ask in a second. Okay. So then, then we break it down into, okay, if you've got the energy and it's the most effective procurement system you have, let's make sure you're using it, right? What are the efficiencies within that? We'll do audits, take a look at the ISOs, whatever it is to make sure you have the best systems, right? Are you monitoring your energy systems? We talk to customers all the time and say, do you have an energy management plan? And they say, absolutely. And they come up with things. All I have to do is say, okay, do you have a meter on site? And they don't. Well, that means you're not monitoring, you're doing 30 day data dumps and it's it's not real data, right? You have to make daily data-driven decisions. And then we break it down into that, what is sustainability? What does that mean to the customer, right? And it doesn't mean that it's what our definition is, it's what, what you guys are trying to accomplish. And then we break that down further into, okay, resiliency, is the energy and power you're getting gonna be there, right? Texas is a perfect example. Can you be down for a week and, and still go, you know, your business not shut down? In the end, it's really around data management, right? Do you have the right data? Are you monitoring it on a regular basis? And how are you managing that data? It's energy management is around data. It truly is from beginning to end. I wanna ask one follow-up, which is that I think um, it was very helpful to understand that thinking of it as, as a roadmap, um, defining goals, obviously being able to measure. I felt like some of that applies to existing operators um, what about for new operations? What, you know, if their goal, if they're coming to you and saying, we want to be hundred percent renewable energy from the get-go, what's some of the advice that you have for them? Yeah. So get, get whoever you're going to consult involved at the very beginning. Um, so people look at Schneider as a manufacturer, right? We do a tremendous amount of services and consultative, but we do, we, we make widgets. So they look at us and say, well, your, your products are too expensive your warranty runs out the day before, you know, whatever it is. Um, so they always look at us as a, you, you stay there, you're going to make us pay too much on the other side. And when we look at it from an energy viewpoint, it's not about the products. We, we're looking at it from get us involved at the beginning so we understand the, the challenges. Because again, if, if the existing facility decides, hey, we want to do a sustainability plan, the, the time and the effort and the costing compared to doing it from the very beginning to, you know, whatever it is years down the road is significant. And, and Schneider can, we can profess to that because 
again, it took us 15 years to get to this point. It's a lot of time and effort. So that's um, that's a really great point, Travis. In terms of sometimes you need to start and think about those things right at the beginning. Um, you know, we we work with growers who are often doing new builds or things like this, and um, it, it's interesting because when you're thinking about the technology of the future, you don't often know what things you need to build in to your systems and to your greenhouse and you know simple things just like internet connectivity and you know if there's wi uh, wi-fi or bluetooth or just being in a position so that those technologies that come down the you know the runway you're able to take advantage of those and yeah i think you know it's a great great piece of advice to share so the growing industry um to me has changed over the last you know five years it's become an industrial production system, right? Everybody looks at food as just, hey, this is a fun greenhouse and we're growing some plants. It's truly an industrial environment and it has to be looked at it like that. And it, it hasn't been over the last, but it's changing that way for sure. Thanks, Travis. Um, I wanna move on to Tracy here because Traders Hill Farm was one of our, the top performers um, from, from all the data that we gathered uh, with the census. Uh, from a resource efficiency standpoint amongst the respondents. So Tracy, tell us what are some of the business practices you've employed to get there and what's the effect that these have had on the relationships with your customers? Because uh, I understand from us chatting before that relationships with your customers is really important to you at Traders Hill. Yes, you know, we have a really close relationship with, with our customers. Um, it's the, the greenhouse grown products, it, 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 our cost to grow is higher, we believe, than conventionally grown produce. So the price for the customer is correspondingly higher. And we have to be able to show value for that, um, for that increased price point. And then we also have to live our values of sustainability. So we're a small company. So while there's um, probably a lot of data sets that we can focus on in terms of sustainability, we focus on, we, we, we do them in small tranches. So in the last 24 months, we focused on, on five areas that, that were our, our pain points. Um, one is um, water usage. Uh, we have water usage, packaging, logistics um, and transportation, energy usage and labor utilization. So those are the five things that we've been working on. So when we look at water usage, you know, every drop of water that comes from our wells is monitored. So we have um, we have meters for what goes into our growing system, and then we can on them we can we can subtract out um, what was what else was used for um, just for facility hygiene and general consumption, so that we know exactly what what water usage we we were um, what water we were using. Um, and where that water is going. Um, packaging is a, is a big one for us. We use the RPCs, the reusable plastic containers for customers that we deliver to directly. So, um, uh, you know, majority of our products do go through wholesale distributors and they have not yet embraced um, the RPC returnable packaging. Um, we do also sell quite a few, we have two um, K to 12 school systems and two university systems and any of our restaurant partners where we're going direct every week or a couple of times a week, we're just using those RPCs and exchanging those. Um, you know, it saves, it saves our customers from having to dispose of cardboard boxes. And, um, you know, from a financial standpoint, they pay for themselves in about six weeks. And the lifespan is, is several years. We've been using them for, for over three years. So that's, um, that, that helps on the, on the cost side, as well as just on the, um, you know, cardboard, you know, just trees. Um, logistics. So we track our logistics cost as a percent of revenue on a monthly basis. And then um, twice annually, we do a deep dive into, into our distribution and look at places where we can consolidate routes. Um, sometimes it means that we have to stop serving a geographic location because the cost to deliver is, is, just, is just too high. Um, and we may require certain customers to perhaps transition to a, to a wholesaler. Um, Energy usage. So that's that's one for us. You know, we we have a facility. We we have a lot of um, a lot of systems in place, 
So we're looking at what are those big offenders, um, you know, in the process of replacing inefficient pumps, um, replacing um, inefficient water chillers with more cost-effective options. And then labor utilization. Um, when, when we look at our income statement, the two highest costs we have are labor and energy. And for me, labor far outpaces my, my energy in terms of costs. So um, we did in 2021, we, we did a complete review of our production workflows in our seed plant harvest and pack house operation um, to make changes. And we were able to take that team and increase their input with less team members and they reduce, we reduce labor hours by about 35% just by going through that exercise. Um, I was about to ask you actually, Tracy, with uh, some of those improvements you've made, what was the time frame to get the ROI back on that initial investment? Uh, you know, how long did it take to, to see benefit from them? So some things like the transportation, when we did that transportation study, we dropped our, um, we, were, we were pretty high. I want to say when we when we when we looked at that, our transportation costs, and I'm ashamed to admit it, was 13% of our revenue, um, which was pretty significant. So we said, okay, I got to cut it in half, at least cut it in half. And so the, it was it was within um, within two months where we brought it down to two and a half. Um, so it really, if if you if, it took us to focus on it. It took yeah. us to focus on, but it's a team effort, right? Because like my operations manager can go through and say, okay, this is what we're doing. And then of course, when you say, well, I'm cutting off certain customers or I'm not doing those routes anymore. You have a sales team that's like, hold on now. <laughs> you know, you can't take customers away from me. Um, so it's a whole team effort. It's, it's a whole team effort to do that. Um, same thing with labor utilization. That took a little longer. Um, um, it took, that took about four months. That, that one's a hard one to get your whole team to buy into, right? Cause they're all like, oh, oh so now we're gonna, you're gonna cut hours, you know, who loses their job? I will say um, for us, it, it, the timing we did it was, was good because we have a tight labor market. Um, and, and really it was, we ended up having some team members leave just because they went to go work at other companies so for me, it was, it was an easier way than saying you're in, you're out. Um, but that took a, a couple of months, but boy, I, you really, it, it made a big, it made a big difference. Um, yeah. You know, so when we had some attrition, it was okay. We're not going to hire back. We're going to figure out a way to, to make this mm. work. Yeah. But, but everything you implemented. Uh, so for anyone thinking that it takes years and years and years to see benefit back, everything you implemented, you're at least seeing within 12 months or, or six months in, in many cases within that period. Oh yeah. And, and things like, you know, RPCs with weeks, it's just <laughs> weeks of, of that. And so, um, so I, you know, there, there are other things that, that we look at that are, that are much longer. Um, so things that I want to focus on one is my option, my um, options for my growing substrates. Um, you know, right now I'm using rock wool, it's not the best option from a sustainability standpoint, um, but it, it does work for us. It has worked for us and it's gonna take us, um, it will take us a while to come up with that alternative that provides us with not just the cost efficiency, but also the germination rate. Um, so, so something like that takes a little longer. So we have to run these things, um, run these things in, in, in parallel and, and, and big initiatives like alternative energy, you know, that's something that 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 may take that that is a little longer game. But I encourage growers to um, to look at at low hanging fruit. You know, where can you get those quick wins, while at the same time um, not losing sight of the fact that that there are some big initiatives you also have to. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, it's interesting. It just it makes me think how much um, of these gains can be process oriented, especially the low hanging fruit. And it reminds me of uh, a stat that we broke down in the census report, which is um, of those that had um, had a dedicated role of the operations that had a dedicated role to monitoring and tracking of sustainability metrics. Of course, they were um, they generally saw improvements uh, over those operations that didn't have somebody dedicated to that 
So it's something that it sounds like if you prioritize it, if you have a person whose job is um, to prioritize these things, that's really a key to you know unlocking, especially the low hanging fruit. Um, all right, let's move on to some quick final questions. Uh, just a reminder that, again, uh, we're going to get to Q&A really quickly. I see that Gretchen did a great job of answering um, a lot of the, the questions that have already come in. So please, this is your time to, to ask any additional questions, um, and we'll get to them really soon. Um, so I want to circle back to just two quick things I heard. Gretchen, if you can respond to this in under 60 seconds, that would be great. Um, you mentioned voluntary versus mandatory uh, benchmarking, and you, you brought up the state of Massachusetts doing some mandatory benchmarking when it comes to cannabis facilities. Where do you see this going in the future? Do you, do you see this being um, sort of an individual state by state thing here in the US? Do you see any countries starting to talk about it? Um, what Give us a sense a little bit of where you think this might go from a regulatory standpoint in maybe the next five years. Well, um, great question. And that's one of the key levers that needs to be pulled in the market transformation effort of the CEA industry is like sensible policies and regulations that help growers while also help regions and countries achieve their climate goals. So um, in the States, what's happening a lot right now is the uh, energy codes and regulators are focusing on cannabis. But what uh, has been interesting recently is the California Title 24 Part 6 Controlled Environment Horticulture Code is uh, crop agnostic and is addressing both greenhouses and indoor farms. And often where California goes, others will follow. And so um, I do anticipate that that type of code will start to be um, adopted across um, crops and mostly just try and address the climate impacts of greenhouses and vertical farms. Um, I won't speak to global policy. I'm not super familiar with it at the moment. I'm focusing on the US right now, um, but that is one thing I see happening. And I think that energy codes are the primary way, way that that's going to happen. Interesting. Maybe we'll pose this to the audience. If anybody has any uh, hot takes on uh, non-US uh, regulatory frameworks that, are, that you're starting to see um, when it comes to tracking or benchmarking of sustainability metrics, please let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear that. Um, okay, one more quick question. Uh, this one for Travis. Travis, <clears throat> just circling back to maybe the energy question. I'm curious to hear again, try to keep it 60 seconds or less. Any specific tactics or financial strategies you've seen operators uh, take to help them plan for clean or on-site um, energy generation from the get-go? Yeah, so that's that's part of that resiliency discussion that we're having. Um, so for everybody's knowledge, one unit of energy used at your facility takes three units of energy at the power plant. So just like uh, food growing, the closer that we can bring that, that unit of power generation to the actual site, the more efficient it's going to be. So your carbon footprint becomes much less. So we start to look at things like on-site generation, right? Can we put a power plant of some kind on site or is it a renewable kind of a concept where we're going to bring in some, some power purchase agreements off of solar? Um, so then the problem is, is when you start looking at things like that, there is a high capital cost, right? On-site generation, we're talking millions and millions of dollars. So we, we want to come up with plans. So one of the things that Schneider's developed is something called energy as a service. So the idea is we come in, we literally become your on-site generator power utility, um, and then the savings that you would be getting from, from that on-site generation, it pays for itself over a period of time, so maybe 10 or 15 years. And then it's like a lease to own. You own it at the end. Um, it's concepts like that. And, and there's, there's multiple out there. We're kind of the leaders on it. But when you come to those ideas, there's, there's options in the market. You don't always have to just say, wow, this, you know, we can't afford this. Well, if we can move it into more of an operating rather than a capital cost, maybe there's some options we can look at. That's a really helpful example, Travis. Thank you. So, I mean, it sounds like the takeaway for me here on the energy front is do your research up front, have an energy plan from the get-go, um, just like you have a plan for, you know, crop management and labor management, all of those things. You should also, you shouldn't take energy for granted um, and you should have a plan from the get-go. So that's, that's really helpful here, that example. Okay, so I want to circle back to a final question here. And then we'll, we'll get to audience Q&A. Um, so if we circle back to the greenwashing uh, question that we started with, 70% of our respondents feeling that the industry is susceptible to excessive greenwashing today. 
if that number were cut in half or even further five years from now, I'm really curious to hear what, what, would, you, what would each of you think is the biggest change that got us there? And let's start with Tracy this time. So I think that the biggest change to get us there is gonna be um, a verification process. It's, it's going to be having, having a certification um, and that, that the industry um, said that, that as an industry we believe in and, and people participate in. Um, because I really loved Gretchen's you know, analogy of stepping on the scale. That, that's, what's gonna, that's what's really gonna move the needle on this one. Awesome. Great chat. That was a that was a pass to you idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I definitely Tracy and I have a lot of alignment on this. Um, I think there's several market transformation strategies that would accomplish this goal. More data describing the ranges of performance in the different segments of CEA, increased development of industry best practices, codes, and standards, and more coordinated support systems from governments and efficiency programs via sensible policies and attractive incentives so growers want to meet high performance standards and share that actual performance with investors and, and consumers. So, so if I was to ask in terms of timeframes, like how long it takes for a government policy or legislation to be, to be implemented, what is something that individuals or businesses can do though in the first you know, outside of something that's going to actually make it happen, what can people do individually to, to shift that dial? I think the strategy number one, the, the data part, uh, everyone has power, like that's an individual power over your own data. And so you don't have to share it, but if you start measuring it yourself, that is where I think that the industry would start course correction. Boom, I think you just did a mic drop moment there and you can walk off right now. Yeah, that is brilliant. Brilliant. Travis, what about you? Yeah, I'm on the same team. So it's all, so, you know, um, Shiner Electric, we actually manage more energy than any company in the world. So we've seen the ability, to, just for instance, the, the data center uh, segment, right? So we, we actually compare the data center market and the vertical grown, the CEA market to be pretty similar, right? Very, very high energy costs. Um, they need to go up very quick. They need to be flexible and scalable uh, and, and complexities and, and it grows. Um, so when they started out, you know, energy wasn't the biggest focus. It was just get these things up. Now their sustainability programs and what they're trying to do is, is significant. And it all started with the idea that basically the Silicon Valley said, okay, we have to become more sustainable. And the entire segment said, okay, we're going to do this. And they created baselines like exactly what Gretchen is, is trying to do with RI and Tracy. And then compare, when you compare that data boy, you start to get that competition going. We love that at Schneider, right? We, we want those, those guys to be able to, how did they do that 10% less? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a good plan. So you get to that, but that competition and the idea of trying to be better, it, it'll change the market. Uh, the human species, we're such a competitive race, aren't we? Um, awesome. Ricky, did you have any other questions? I see one sitting in the Q&A box. That's actually quite interesting um, that I'd love to hear. Yeah, let's let's read that one out really quick. Yeah, so this one was from uh, David Hatch, who said he's working to develop community leadership buy-in to deploy greenhouse and vertical farming technologies for a desert community, and would welcome any suggestions. Where to start, Tracy? Any thoughts? Um, so I, I would say the value of being able to grow food in, a, in, in an environment that traditionally isn't a growing area. So, um, you know, nice thing about CEA, even though we have to modify our facilities based on where we're putting them, is we can put them closer to the consumer. And, um, and, and that, that's, a, that's a big deal. It, it helps with the availability of, of products and also with those transportation costs. I mean, Ricky, you've had um, agritechs work with quite a few growers in the UAE and, and desert regions, haven't you? Yeah, you know, for us, oftentimes it's really about starting with um, with your objectives. So, for example, like when I just hear, you know, desert community, I think of you know that could be that there's um, that you're looking to to deploy this as a job creator. Um, and so there's, it's more of a kind of economic development strategy for the region. 
Um, depending on where you are, there might be a lot of incentives, government incentives um, for doing that. Um, or it might be that you're in a region that is importing a ton or all of its fresh produce. And so in that case, I would say really start with your customers, identify who your customers are, um, figure out what their needs are and, and start there. That would be my, my quick two cents. But yes, Agritecture would love to help you. Um, this is exactly what we do. Fantastic. Uh, Gretchen or Travis, any thoughts around that question? I would just circle back to the first question of like quantify what green means to you and then value what those different strategies are worth. So if water conservation or water circularity is a goal, then maybe that's more important to spend money on than energy infrastructure. So um, it's, yeah, that's what I'd think about and work with a design consultant to think about that. And I'm just going to add, I mean, so one of the uh, numbers I saw that I was kind of taken aback on that 10% of all the energy in the U.S. is used for farm to fork uh, to grow the transportation, everything. That's that's a staggering number, right? Um, to, to take even 1% of that <clears throat> and offer it to, so even if it is a desert area for food, there's options to it. And if you can impact that, I mean, the grants and the money and even the private equity that's out there that want to participate in that because there's huge funds that are looking for ways to impact, right? So Walmart with its uh, gigaton, it's letting other companies come in and be part of their scope three emissions concept. So there's lots of options, even on the private sector to, to put investments into those things. Awesome. Um, and I think actually, um, Gretchen, we just had a, a question pop up, which actually Ricky's also answered around financial sustainability as part of sustainability and any thoughts around where to find comparable financial metrics um, for a greenhouse producer. If you think people are touchy about sharing their energy data, just wait until you get them to share their financial data. <laughs> I would say that uh, power score stays in the lane of E in the ESG. We try to focus on the environment and quantify the uh, environmental impact but we want to play nicely with the financial KPIs that are developed and really link them together. But um, I don't have a name right now that I would say is out there. I think it's something that needs to be supported just like the, um, the sustainability uh, metrics are being supported. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we've had a few questions around finding those benchmarking numbers and, and data. And, and look, I mean, especially on a global scale or, or in other regions, the, the simple answer to many of this is it doesn't exist in a lot of ways, you know, because people aren't necessarily putting their metrics out for public consumption. Um, but what I would say is this is the chance for everyone to start benchmarking themselves against themselves, just to have the data ready to go so that if there is other benchmarking data that comes along, then you're already up and running, you have something that you can measure against. Um, because you're right, Gretchen, I mean, there are many things that grow, growers and Tracy could probably attest to, won't share. Um, obviously your financial data or how you got your great yield is also another one that um, people like to keep under their hats. So um, I would say start with your own business first and, and then get working on that. Uh, what else? So we are coming up to time here. I wanna just quickly give um, all of our speakers time to give a final call to action, just one call mm -hmm. to action. Um, and Kylie, do you want to lead us off and then we'll, uh, I'll go and we'll go to our speakers. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the, uh, and I, I kind of, I mean, we've said it many times through this, if you're, if you're not tracking, if you're not measuring, then get started. That's, you know, that's all I can say is, is get, do the homework and find the tools that will help you in your business to start tracking those measurements. Um, I think that's just number one for me. Um, Tracy, what about you? I agree with that wholeheartedly. You know, what, what's measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. And I would say, um, you know, advice would be if, if, if a grower's not currently, um, if they don't have a plan in place, start small and realistic. Because if you if you lay out 40 KPIs, then it's going to become more of a of a drain on you and your staff, and it, and it won't get done. 
So, so, so pick those, pick those pain points, start with five or six. And um, I also say spread the love so that different team members are respond if it if it falls to one person um oftentimes that can be too easy to 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 push off or not do or move to the next month and you go through a whole quarter and realize you haven't you haven't reflected on those kpis but if you um do a divide and conquer and then have those monthly meetings where everyone's coming back with their um with with their for the kpi roundup you'll you'll start to you will start to see um improvement and if you really hone in on like what, when we when we looked at our transportation, we're like, we're going down and, and we just had a had a whole team focus on that. We were really able to make make some differences. So I would say you've got to measure, but start small. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, uh, the last thing I would say is connecting to the energy codes and policies questions, governments and efficiency programs are going to create baselines with or without you. So if you don't measure, there will be policies that come out and start to require you to benchmark or require you to be more energy efficient than the typical greenhouse. And you might not know whether you're near that or not. And, um, and as ESG reporting becomes more popular and companies are global, I think that like Tracy said, certification is important and you're not gonna be able to certify unless you quantify your impacts. So just get ready for it and, and be future proof. Yeah, actually, that's a great point, Gretchen, in terms of um, one of the best ways is to um, collect your metrics before you even introduce any changes, because then you can see that improvement. It's no use introducing them. And then someone goes, well, what was the difference between pre and post all these improvements? So absolutely. Yeah, yeah without monitoring first, you're assuming that the data being received by your sensors is accurate. So mm -hmm. Um, just collect data for a while, watch trends, and then you can actually understand what changes are necessary, inform the work that you ask your facilities team to do. Yeah, perfect. And Travis, what about you? Last thing is ask for help. Um, <clears throat> this, this can be a daunting task. Um, and when you start to get into it, it can be overwhelming very, very quickly. So breaking it down into parts and pieces and asking for help, um, it, it makes the, the journey much, much easier. Thank you, Travis. Um, and I'll, I'll add to that with um, something from agritecture. You know, we really, the 70% number um, was, was something that we just spent such a long time at agritecture talking about. And we'd spent a lot of 2021 just talking about what we feel like, what we felt like was a growing um, issue in CEA around sustainability and around how um, especially large companies in the space and large operators are talking about it. We really are trying to push the conversation forward. It's part of the reason that um, Kylie and I decided to focus on sustainability uh, because Way Beyond was also on the same page there with the CEA census in 2021. Um, but Agritecture also wanted to go a step further. So today we're actually releasing a sustainability communications guide for free on our website. Um, my colleague, can, Duane, can drop it in the chat here. Um, and it's a really simple guide. It's, it's a few pages. Um, you know, just covers some definitions and um, uh, really an overview of, of what we hear today in the industry, some challenges to, to what we hear, um, and also some evidence in support of those claims, because let's remember that CEA also has some amazing benefits. Um, so hopefully this will be a really helpful guide to help companies in the space think about how they can better communicate about sustainability, how they can add more nuance, um, how they can bring their audience into the discussion rather than maybe just uh, you know, sending out a tagline uh, and claiming that something is is 100% sustainable. Um, so that's really where we want to get the industry. Um, we're really excited about all the contributions that uh, our, our guests mentioned, our speakers mentioned on, on this panel, some really good thoughts. Um, you know, I think the biggest takeaway for me is start measuring. Um, <laughs> and I'm really excited to see what data we get back from uh, this next census or any other reports that come out uh, in the next year or two. Absolutely. Um, so uh, let's wrap that up. So on behalf of uh, Way Beyond and Agritecture, Ricky and myself, we absolutely want to thank uh, Tracy Gretchen and Travis for joining us today um, and sharing your insights. Uh, I think it is, um, as, as we sort of mentioned, sustainability is not a horrible thing. It's nothing to be afraid of. You just need to get started. And if we can support anyone 
taking that first step, then um, we are absolutely here to do that. And we want to thank everyone who has dialed in to um, be with us live or is watching this on video. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact either myself or Ricky, um, or obviously we can direct your questions to the panelists. Um, so thank you everyone. And um, yeah, we'll sign off there. Thanks everyone.